master, the tempest is raging. When a new one, new hymnal came about, I, I, I searched it diligently to find the song. It's not there. So I had to retrieve back to the whole hymnal sometimes to cheer up myself with a song that I love. The word of God says, when a man ways please the Lord, even his enemy, he allowed to be at peace with him. Even the storms, if it's our enemy, God will allow the storm to be still and be at peace with God's children. So this morning, heading towards a little bit to afternoon, we are here to pray. We are told that prayer is a opening of the heart to God as to a friend. We talk to him anytime, anywhere. <clears throat> he promises that before we call, he answers. While we are yet speaking, he hears. So God doesn't do things because we ask him to do it or we beg him to do it. God works on his own initiative. God works because he sees his children in need of his divine help. And so he runs to our rescue before we even call on him. And so at this moment, beloved, let us bow together. Let's bow together on our knees as we petition God's throne and mercy. His grace and his mercy has brought us through. And his grace and his mercy will lead us onward and upward until we reach the place where he wants us to reach. Let us pray. Our loving Father, our God in heaven, we've come this far by faith, leaning on your everlasting arms. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, to know that there is a place of quiet rest. It's near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest. It's near to the heart of God. And so this morning, we come bowing before your presence, loving Father, to tell you thanks for being our God. Surely you have been a good God to us. Throughout this week, we have been battered, bruised by the enemy. We have been knocked down, but thank God we have been we are not knocked out. Because you have been there with us. You put us to bed last night, Father. You watch over us as we slept. You wake us up this morning in our rightful mind. And you brought us safely in your courts. Where we can come to worship and adore your name. Father, it is because of your goodness. Why we are not consumed. Because your compassion fail not. They are new every morning. Amen. Great loving Father is your faithfulness towards your children. And so we come this morning to give you thanks, to praise your name, to honor you for the battles fought, for the victories won. Because we are here today to praise your name because of your goodness. And so, Father, we come with many problems. We come with a lot of cares. We are going through difficult times. But you ask us to cast our cares upon you. Because you cares for us. There are so many of us. Faces are differing this morning. It's an indication that we have been. We, we, we have been through many storms. We have been through many situations. But God we thank you to know that you are still there. You are the God of our past. You are the God of our present. And we are thankful to know that as we place our trembling hands now in your hands, you will lead us through the future because you are our future. And so for our Father, for whatever cares we come with this morning, we are placing them at the foot of the cross. Loving Lord, we are help, we're asking you to please help us not to take them up when we rise from our knees, but that we leave our cares at the foot of the cross. 
We'll leave our cares on Jesus because he promised to take care of us. Father, we are crying out this morning for help in various situations that exist. Father, if ever time we need you, it is now. The world is going through crisis. But we are thankful to know that Jesus, you are the Christ in every crisis. You are the solvent for every situation. But you just want us to trust in you with all our hearts and to lean not to our own understanding. Help us, loving Father, to, in all our ways, to acknowledge you. And you will direct our path. Many are crying out this morning for loss of loved ones. We place them into your divine hands. We truly remember those who are suffering injuries, even in Las Vegas this morning. Many loved ones have gone down by the hand of cruel gunmen, but God, we place every situation into your hands. And we cry out to you this morning, loving Father, because we know that whatever the pain is, you are still the balm in Gilead. You still comfort the heart of your children. And you promise you'll never leave nor forsake. And so we keep our trust. We put our trust and our confidence in you, Father. We come even closer home, Brother Robert, and those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones even this morning, Father. In our, in our midst, there are people who are suffering. There are people who are going through trying times. Loving Father, we're just placing each one today in your hands. Remember your church. Remember your children. In love and mercy, be with us all. Guide and keep us and protect us from the hands of the wicked one. We know, loving Father, that he knows that his time is short and so he's doubling his effort against your children. But we pray, God, that you will bind the old serpent. Hold him in check. And just come true for your children as we unleash your faith and our confidence in you. Let the enemy know that he's a defeated foe. Because we are on the winning side. And we can shout for joy. Because Jesus has already gained that victory. And so they that are with us are more than they that be with them. So the victory is assured. And we claim it today in the name of Jesus. Oh, Father, we place in your hands at this moment our pastor, one whom you have chosen to lead the flock at such a time as this. Truly, it's an interesting time to be alive and to see the unfolding of situations in our world. And so you have called a man to stand up for the right, though the heavens fall. To stand true to duty as a needless to the pole. To call sin by its name. And to declare your righteousness. So that God, your righteousness can cover the earth as the waters cover the rolling sea. And so God, we know. We know that the day is coming. When you'll take the rain in your hands and you will do the work through us. Cut it short in righteousness because your coming is very near. So, Father, we come to you today because we need a word. We need a word to encourage us to stay strong, to be courageous, and to go forward. So, you have asked your man servant, Pastor Ed Castle, to be your mouthpiece today. 
Father in heaven, we pray, I pray today that you'll take a life call from the altar and you will touch his lips. So as he speaks, loving Father, he'll speak for you. You will speak through him. As a matter of fact, you'll speak to him. Then speak through him so he can speak to your people. The message will come forth in clarity and with power. With conviction that truly Jesus is alive and well. And is fighting for his children. And so we place everything now into your hands. And ask that you will take full control because this is your moment. This is your hour. Have your own sweet way. Let your will, thy will be done. As we wait at your feet. And claim the victory today. In the mighty name of Jesus, let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Emmanuel Choir, thank you. Amen. I believe I will uh, be brief this afternoon. because we could use less sermonizing and more practical Christian living. Christians, believers, don't have to be the saddest people on the planet. For we know for we know where our help comes from and it is not we who love, forgive, and bless, and pray in our own strength but it's the Holy Spirit, Amen. which is the presence of Christ in our life, Amen. who does that in and through us. Yes. And thank God we get an opportunity just to cooperate and walk with the Lord. Yes. For we are his redeemed. We are blessed and highly favored. Amen. I want to, as we begin... Is it okay to use the lapel? I'd rather have my hands free. Is it all right? Can you hear me okay? All right. I, w I would rather have my hands free. Thank you. I want to encourage everyone who is either watching or listening to my voice and you see me and I see you, go to the website and register for Pale Horse Rides. The registration is free. You don't need to put any detailed information, but simply contact how we may track and keep record of who is planning on attending and who will attend. And that's palehorserides.com forward slash Orlando. So we've got our own website. Amen. Amen. Palehorserides.com forward slash Orlando. And up on the right hand side, you'll see the area there to register. Let me share something with you. <clears throat> 
a pastor was struggling to prepare his sermon and didn't want to be disturbed by his five-year-old daughter. So he removed the map of the world from his study and he tore it in pieces and gave it to his daughter to assemble with the promise that he would answer all her questions and play with her when she was done. You see, he knew, he knew she would never be able to fix it. To his amazement, in less than five minutes, she returned to him in his study with the map in perfect shape, every continent and every country in its place. The surprised father asked, honey, you don't know anything about geography, so how did you fix the world so easily and quickly? And the five-year-old girl smiled sweetly and replied, the picture of Jesus was at the back. the back of the map and I knew that if I have Jesus in the right place the whole world would be in perfect shape and that was just the right inspiration he needed for his sermon he thanked his daughter and prepared a powerful sub sermon on the subject fix your world by placing Jesus at the right place. Jesus in his rightful place in our lives will be the order of the day. And the question is, do you really, really understand this? That the chaos, the confusion, the rhetoric that is being promoted and, and just fueled it's almost as if it was a godless, Christless world. But with Jesus in the right place, this world can be a better place. But I'm confident of this very thing too, that that which we have before us, is evidence that God's promises and his prophecies are being fulfilled. And that means the end will come. Now you don't have to be scared. They may destroy this body, but my soul rests in Christ. And you can be confident of that very truth today there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun we can be confident in Christ the old song says if I can help somebody along this way my living will not be in vain just be of help in any way you can. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, please, this moment, as was asked in the prayer, I'm asking you again to touch, Lord, touch me hearers with the coal from your sacred holy altar that the words communicated may reach the ears that are listening and transform the heart may there be a divine connection today between the intellect and the emotion and may we Surrender and forsake every preconceived notion of how you are to move and do your work. But may we be open today to understand that being a part of your church, your body, 
It's a commitment to you and to each other. Continue to make us, mold us, and fashion us. Holy Spirit, have your way in Christ's holy name. Amen. There is a unique and dynamic relationship that exists between a husband and his wife, unlike any other on the planet. Whether one is a believer in Jesus or not, the marriage relationship is a sacred one that was designed to reflect to a degree the grace and glory of God in our lives. In the book of Genesis, it is found that Adam, our father of the human race, was by himself after pronouncing identity to all cattle, all birds, and every beast of the field. And God, the Bible says, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And Adam, if God caused to sleep, he did sleep. And God took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined or cling to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And verse 25 says that they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You may be wondering, if you looked in your bulletin, where is he going with this title, Stop Attacking My Wife? Oh, you didn't open your bulletin yet? Turn here. Stop Attacking My Wife. Oh, how the invasion of sin and distrust have torn apart the beauty of being unashamed in another's presence. With the entrance of sin, our vision has become darkened. With the entrance of sin, our perceptions have become selfish. With the entrance of sin, our suspicion of others have become hypersensitive. They were naked, the Bible says, and unashamed. They were in their birthday suits clothed with the light of God's glory. They were not, they were not naked and afraid, they were naked and unashamed. The image we have here in Genesis of humanity being unashamed before God and before each other is what Christ Jesus came to restore, to save us from sin, lawlessness, and selfishness. Whether we are Guyanese, whether Jamaican, American, Trinidadian, Haitian, Puerto Rican, Canadian, European, Mexican, or Asian, the Lord Jesus has given himself to restore into humanity the image of God. The commitment and dedication that a husband must make to his wife, Christ has made to his church. The question is, who or what is the church? Well, the church, the church of Christ is the theater of his grace. You missed that. It's the theater of his, not the world, but his church is the theater of his grace. It is the display to the world and to the universe of God's power to transform the selfish and broken heart into a heart that's overflowing with love and compassion. It is his appointed agency, this pen of inspiration says, it is his appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service 
And its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. Its mission. The church is a people of every nation, every kindred, and tongue who have intelligently and willingly responded to God's amazing grace and his forgiveness. <clears throat> and they have committed themselves to be his servants. Listen. Committed them, themselves to be his servants to carry forth his mission. His mission in the earth. His church. God's church. His wife. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear is the one object upon which God bestows in a special sense his supreme regard. And he delights, listen, he delights to reveal his power to transform hearts through his church. You ever wonder what made God happy? What really makes God happy? To display his power. To display his ability to transform your heart and your heart and your heart into a heart that is, that is sensitive to his thoughts. Sensitive to his thoughts. Sensitive to his heart. I love the book of Deuteronomy, one of my favorite of the Bible. And chapter 30 and verse 6 says this. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Why? Why? Why do that? And the, and the question is answered in verse 6, that you may live. The Lord circumcises the heart and the heart of our descendants to love to obey, to be faithful. Why? So that we may live. Not that so we may be robots. So that we may live. Because he is life. That we may live. I love this. You see, the church, listen very closely, the church is not the standard of truth. But the church upholds the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. And what, is, what truth is that? I'm glad you're asking. Talk back to the preacher. What truth is that? You can ask. Thank you, Elder Sippy. What truth is that? You, you, you see, going back as far as the time of Solomon, Israel had become strong among the nations. Opportunities abounded for her to exercise a mighty influence in behalf of truth and right. And the name of God was exalted and held in high honor. That was God's purpose in establishing for himself a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that he would be glorified and barriers that separated people would be broken down. It is noted that during the reign of Solomon and the reign of David, his father, the surrounding nations to Israel had within themselves seekers for truth, even though they were heathen nations. They had within themselves seekers looking for truth. They desired a holier purpose for their existence. And I've read in Prophets and Kings, it says that they were not turned away unsatisfied as they sought for what? Sought for the heathen nations, the surrounding nations were not turned away unsatisfied as they sought truth. Conversions, page 25. Conversions took place, quoting, and the church of God on earth was enlarged and prospered. Hmm. The 
church did not just start in Acts. The church did not just start when Christ arrived on the scene. God had a church of people that were faithful to him from the very, very beginning. God is no respecter of persons. You see, in every generation, they that fear the Lord and work righteousness are accepted of him, while those who murmur and are unbelieving and are rebellious will not have his favor nor the blessings that are promised to those who love the truth and walk in it. Third volume of the Testimonies, page 171 and 172. See, it is very possible that we sitting here today in our soul is a dark cloud. It could be a stain that through all our efforts to remove, we've been unsuccessful. Now that darkness, because we've been unsuccessful, has become our companion. We don't struggle any longer. We give in and substituted following, <clears throat> excuse me, substituted following God God's ways for our ways, and we've disregarded the light that God has shown us. And God's blessings can turn to curses when we don't follow his way. And we think that we're receiving God's blessings, but his blessings, if we say, God, not your agenda, but mine, my agenda, and we think we're following God's ways, his blessings will turn to curses, and the very mercies which we, we desire and entertain will turn into condemnation. We cannot follow our own ways. History shows us that following our own ways in light of God's glory only leads to rebellion and destruction. His church, Israel is a testimony. They followed their own ways. But God was patient with them. He was patient with them. He still has a purpose for his church. God has a purpose. You know, if we did not call ourselves Emmanuel, God will still have a purpose for you. Did you know that? Because it is not necessarily, Sister Lewis, that Emmanuel is recorded in his book. But what's recorded in his book is Marshana. What's recorded in his book is Alicia. What's recorded in his book is Sindel. What's recorded in his book is Gibbon. What's recorded in his book is your name. Your name. Why does that matter? It matters because we have to decide and determine who we belong to, whose we are. If they tore down this building, or it got locked up, or whatever, hurricane, what's the one coming now? There's another one. Nate? It's not coming, coming this way, but it's out there. Rest assured, we're okay. Nate. And Nate came and destroyed this this building, this edifice. Listen. Whew. Glory. We've got to put priorities where they need to be. Because the building would be destroyed doesn't mean that the church is destroyed. Because the church 
Come on, guys. The church is the theater of God's grace. And his grace is not displayed in the walls. His grace is displayed in the lives of living individuals. Living stones that he himself is putting together and building up. Living stones. God has a purpose for his church. His church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. Acts of the Apostles, page 9, chap, uh, paragraph 1. You know, what God starts, he sees through to the end. Yet, at the same time, God has limited himself to work with selfish ragamuffins. He has limited himself to work through and with ragamuffins like you and me. He has indeed bound himself to us in such a way that the fulfillment of his glory that his church should show to him is not contingent on his ability, but is dependent on our willingness to cooperate with his agenda. Because he's able. He's able. I know that he is able. I know my Lord is able to carry us through. But that is dependent on our willingness to cooperate with his plan. And he does not, hallelujah, need to reveal his plan to mortals. He simply says, trust me. I know I can speak to the storm. And tell it, peace, be still. We don't need to know everything. But we've got to commit our souls to him. And through it all, be faithful. Now listen, listen, listen. There are times, there are times, there are times where faithfulness leaves us. There are times where we're not faithful to the Lord and our devotion and our commitment to him. There are times, and I'm, listen, I'm not talking about just tithe and offering. I'm talking about allegiance and loyalty. You cannot serve two masters. It is a spiritual, cosmic conflict and battle for the Lord Jesus to sit on the throne of your heart. And if he's not sitting there, he cannot partially be on the throne, half on and half off. If he's not there, someone or something else is there. And it's not always the devil. He can't be everywhere. He's just one. He's not omnipresent. Sometimes it's our egos. Unconsecrated. Sometimes it's our selfish desires. Unyielded. Sometimes it's just just the bad, rotten attitude that needs to be transformed. But through all of that, he loves his church. As wicked as we can be to each other, he loves his church as ungrateful as we can be with each other. He loves his church as discouraging as we can be with one another. He loves his church 
and as short-sighted as we can be with our purpose in his hands. He loves his church as selfish as we can be with his stuff. He loves his church as compromising as we are in principles. He loves his church. So because he still loves us ragamuffins, he says, stop attacking my wife. As enfeebled and defective as it may appear, stop attacking my wife. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and, and, that means there's something else to be considered to pay attention to, and gave himself for her. Why? Why did Jesus do this? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might whoo, present her to himself. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish. Amen. Now, in case you missed it, he presents her to himself. <laughs> he doesn't say, Claude, get her right and present her to me. Because y'all, I can't do that. He doesn't say, Gibbon, get her right and present her to to me because you can't do that he doesn't say for the conference get her right and present her to me they can't do that nor does he say any preacher any evangelist or pastor get her right and present her to me it is not in our strength nor ability to do so that's why scripture says he presents her to himself. Whoo! As dirty as we are, as compromising as we are, he loves you so much that he will wash you and he'll cleanse you and present you to himself. Can you imagine? You ever been given a gift and that, or, or somebody has done something for you, like restored a piece of furniture, yes. right? Yes. It was yours. It was handed down, and you didn't know how to fix it up or get it right. And you asked, hey, brother so-and-so. Or they say, you know, I'll fix that for you. And they sand it down, and, and they polish it up, and they, and they uh, uh, polyurethane and put the ceiling and coat on it, and, and they present it to you, yes. restored. Yes. But Jesus does all of that and then presents you to him. If you are willing. If you are willing. He presents the church himself. 
as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Christ is saying to us now, in the most desperate time that the world needs a living witness of the glory and sufficiency that is found in Jesus, stop attacking my wife. Because it's not your personal social club. It is not a platform for your ego to be stroked or to satisfy selfish ambition. This is not that kind of theater to parade your unconsecrated efforts and abilities. It is the theater of God's grace and his sufficiency. I pray that the Holy Spirit would illuminate our narrow thinking and that we are not just a church when we come here on Sabbath but we are his church when we go out into the marketplace into the lives of people for whom Christ has died I pray Lord deliver us from that madness. Isaiah 56 verses 6 to 8 says this. <clears throat> also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants. To be what? Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain. And I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices, this is, this is God speaking, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house, shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Lord Jesus, the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, says, yet will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Here's the secret. Shh, don't tell nobody. The invitation is, he wants you to be part of that gathering and to invite others. He wants us to be a part. For his glory, to show forth his sufficiency, He wants us to be a part of that gathering. Stop attacking my wife. You don't know what you're doing. Because Christ says, I purchased her. I'm making her into what I want her to be. I gave myself for her. I'm the one that administers the bridal bath. The bridal bath. I administer it. I wash her. I clean her. I then present her to myself. If Jesus does all this and more for his church, why do we attack her? Why do we attack her? Why do we speak evil against her? Why do we grumble and complain about her? And if you didn't yet figure it out, 
when we do that, if this was a mirror, we're talking about ourselves. Why would you want to be part of something that don't? We're all intelligent people. Stop attacking my wife. We have to believe the promises of Christ. He is coming to claim his own. And that should inspire us with eagerness to be prepared to receive him, to be, to be received by him. Stop attacking my wife. I'm going to end with this. Kept you a little long today. Actually, no. I got up a little late. Thank you, Sister Smith. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking my full allotted time. I shared this with the church um, some Wednesdays ago. A dream to one of the founders of the Advent, Advent movement had. I want to encourage you about God's ability to take care of us. And if he has the ability to take care of us, if we are willing and humble enough, we can help take care of each other. Because this is the theater of God's grace and sufficiency. I dream that God, by an unseen hand, sent me a curiously wrought casket about 10 inches long by 6 square, made of ebony and pearls that were curiously inlaid. To the casket, there was a key attached. I immediately took the key and opened the casket and went to my, when, to my wonder and surprise, I found it filled with all sorts and sizes of jewels and diamonds and precious stones and gold and silver coin of every dimension and value, beautifully arrayed in their several places in the casket, and thus arranged, they reflected a light and glory equal only to the sun. The casket represents the great truths of the Bible relative to the second advent coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which were given to Brother Miller, William, to publish to the world. See, the jewels, the things inside the casket, the jewels, the diamonds, etc., of all sorts and sizes, so beautifully arranged in their places in the casket, represent the children of God. Malachi 3, verse 17. I pause at the wrong place. And this is also found in early writings, 81 to 84. The jewels, the diamonds, represent the children of God from all the churches and from almost every station and situation of life who receive the Advent faith and were seen to take a bold stand in their several stations in the holy cause of God's truth. You follow? Are you following? You following? Yes? yes? I thought it was not my duty to enjoy this wonderful sight alone, although my heart was overjoyed at the brilliancy, the beauty, and the value of the contents of the casket. I therefore placed it in the center table in my room, and I gave out a word that all who had a desire might come and see the most glorious and brilliant sight ever seen by man in this life. And guess what? The people started coming in. The people began to come in, at first a few in number, but increasing to a crowd. When they first looked into the casket, they would, they would wonder and shout for joy. But when the spectators increased, everyone would begin to trouble the jewels. And who are the jewels? Who are the jewels? We are. 
began to trouble the jewels, taking them out of the casket and scattering them on the table, I began to think that the owner would require the casket and jewels at my hand, and if I suffered them to be scattered, I could never place them in their places in the casket again as before, and I felt I should never be able to meet that accountability, for it would be too immense. I then began to plead with the people not, not to handle them, nor to take them out of the casket, but the more I pleaded, the more they scattered, and now they seemed to scatter them all over the room, on the floor, and on every piece of furniture in the room. I then saw that among the genuine jewels and the genuine coins, they had scattered an innumerable quantity of fake counterfeit coins. I was highly incensed at their base conduct and ingratitude and, and reproved and repro reproached them for it. But the more that I reproved and said, no, stop, the more they scattered the fake jewels and the false coins among the real. I became vexed in my physical soul and began to use physical force to push them out of the room. But while I was pushing out one, three more would come in. And they would bring in, enter, and bring in dirt and shavings and sand and all manner of rubbish until they covered every one of the true jewels, diamonds, and coins, which were all excluded from sight. Couldn't see them anymore. They also tore in pieces the casket and scattered it among the rubbish. And I thought no man regarded my sorrow and my anger. I became hopefully I became wholly discouraged and disheartened, and I sat down and I wept. While I was thus weeping and mourning for my great loss and my great accountability, I remembered God and I earnestly prayed that he would send me some help. Immediately the door opened. Hello, somebody. Immediately the door opened. And a man entered the room. When the people all left it, and he, having a dirt brush in his hand, opened the windows and began to brush the dirt and the rubbish from the room. I cried to him to forbear, for there was some precious jewels scattered among the rubbish. And you know what he said to me? Fear not, for he would take care of them. Then, while he brushed the dirt and rubbish, false jewels and counterfeit coin all arose and went out of the window like a cloud. And the wind carried them away. In the bustle, I closed my eyes for a moment. When I opened them, the rubbish was all gone. The precious jewels, the diamonds, the gold, the silver coins lay scattered in profusion all over the room. He then placed on the table a casket, much larger and more beautiful than the one before. And he gathered up the jewels, the diamonds, and the coins by the handful. And he placed them into the casket till not one was left, although some of the diamonds were not bigger than the point of a pin. Everybody is significant. Yes. Yes. He then called upon me. <laughs> come and see. Come and see. Come. Come and see. And I looked into the casket, but my eyes were dazzled with sight. They shone with ten times more the glory than before. And I thought they had been scorned in the sand by the feet of those wicked persons who had scattered and trod them in the dust. They were arranged in beautiful order in the casket. Everyone in his place, without any visible signs of how they were put in. I shouted with joy. And my shout woke me from the dream. The 
This is God's church. Stop attacking his wife. And if I can bring a word to husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Stay on board. We're not what we're supposed to be, but we're not what we used to be. Let us allow God to determine what we are to do, who we are to be. Let him give us his agenda. The reason why I read that because I believe that's the experience of many of us in here. We have people coming in, people that have been here, and we complain. And we get frustrated. And we start criticizing instead of encouraging. Now, there's a line to be drawn. There is a line to be drawn. But the man that walked through the door, if he hadn't got it yet, was Jesus. Fear not. I will take care of them. And he'll give us a new casket. He'll give us a new casket. He will present you to himself. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. He will not lead you astray. And I want you to stay on board. Stay on board. Do you believe the word of God? Stand with me. How does mortal man, Father, Holy Father, end your message? This is your message. We have no authority to put an end on your message. But Heavenly Father, please, If it's time for your benediction, you place your hand on it. I pray, God, that there may be one, two, three, several who have heard the word of truth today. And they want to make a decision, or they're not sure what or how to go once they leave here. And I pray, God, that you would take a moment and help them to walk down this aisle. Because there's an opportunity not only to say yes to Jesus again, not only to recommit to Jesus again, but there's an opportunity to say yes for the first time. That your church is your agency as messed up as we are it's still your church whom you love whom you died for and we've yet to lord experience the 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 the, 
the love, the other centeredness that you say, that you said would happen. For we've been operating on our own agendas. Bringing to you and asking you for your approval. Not even asking you, Lord, but bringing to you and saying you'll have to accept this. But Lord, may it be far from us so that our souls may be enriched so that there is a generation that it will go well with our descendants that they may live is there one who wants to say yes to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins to see him as Lord to see him as Savior to see him as Christ in your life is there one is there one Is there one who wants to join this church? Right here, this body of believers in Orlando, I see you, my sister. We'll get your information. Who wants to join this church? This body of believers. Not identified only with the name of Emmanuel, but identified under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Identified being blood washed born again Holy Spirit filled travelers is there another one amen so father thank you Thank you. It is not over. You are still speaking. But this part will bring to an end. But ask you to still take over. Bless the sister here who has decided and wants to be part of this church, this congregation. I pray, Father, for that soul who needs. Pray, Lord. For that soul who needs encouragement, who needs deliverance from sin, from whatever bondages they, that, that has them down, may they turn it over to you. Take it in Christ's name. And God's people say, and so shall it be.